Good afternoon, all, and welcome to this seminar, this webinar on uh, academic career assessment in the transition to open science. So this webinar is the third one and the last one of a series of three highly interconnected webinars. Um, I will provide you a brief summary, a recap of day one and day two for those of you who uh, could not join us. Um, on Monday, we set the scene uh, with the presentation and a discussion of two surveys. One survey from AUA, European University Association, on um, research assessment in the transition to open science. And uh, the other survey was a survey by uh, Science Europe on the research assessment process itself. So we've had, as Bernard Rantier said uh, back then, we've had like two major actors building blocks um, that could be um, discussed. That was on day one. Uh, on day two, yesterday, we broadened um, the discussion to academic career assessment. Um, and the context here is the different missions of uh, universities. So we discussed the range of evaluation criteria for assessing open science activities. We discussed uh, teaching a career path. There was a special focus on the specific situation of early career researchers. And also there was a clear uh, a need um, and a call for system change at many different levels, actually at all levels. It could be local, regional, European, oh, national, I forgot national, European and even global. And there, um, there was a focus on the European uh, Union research and innovation uh, policy and um, funding. That was um, webinars one and two. Now, today, we will focus on the opportunities and challenges for concerted approaches to reviewing career assessment. So we will have different um, initiatives at different levels, institutional and uh, national, but also we will have um, a European um, perspective on this. Now you have on the screen um, the names and uh, titles of our speakers today. Um, this webinar is being recorded. It's been the case also uh, on a Monday and Tuesday, and all the webinars will be made available um, on uh, YouTube, uh, the, the channel of EUA. Um, you have at the <laughs> bottom right of your screen, you have a chat box. We invite you to use it and um, to use it to ask questions to the speakers for the Q&A session. Uh, we will try to make it um, active, uh, responsive. Uh, we've seen also, and we were very happy with this, that uh, this chat has been used as a living animal in itself for a parallel, very good and lively discussion amongst uh, the audience. So we, we are very happy with this and we encourage you to keep doing this if you want to. Um, I think it's about it on my side. Now I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Dag Hune Olsen, um, who is the president of Universities Norway and the rector of the University of Bergen. And the reason why uh, um, Dak will have a few words uh, today is that this uh, webinar series originally was supposed to be a workshop, physical workshop in Oslo, hosted by our colleagues from Universities Norway. And so he would have had a welcome address to us, but now he will have nevertheless a virtual welcome address. So, uh, Dag, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, it is virtual, but it's uh, heartily felt from my side. And um, I'm pleased to, to, warm, to warm welcome you all to, to take part in this webinar 
on how to modernize career assessment to processes around it for our scientific staff. Developing new and more, let's say, comprehensive career policies for our academic staff has actually been a priority for universities in Norway and, of course, all the universities in Norway as such for almost 10 years. And in uh, 2018, we embarked on an action plan for open science also in Norway, amongst the universities and also universities in Norway. This uh, coincided, obviously, with the... Um, research funders launching Pla Plan S, as well as an enhanced effort, I'd say, to come to new agreements with the big publishers that uh, com uh, complied with uh, open access standards and, and adhering also to the overarching open access strategy. I believe that open science cannot become a reality, so to speak, without changing the academic system or reward system. So that's why we also need to look at our career assessments and the processes attached to that, affiliated to that. Furthermore, changing the uh, uh, reward system in one institution or the assessment career assessment system in one institution or in one country alone, well, that will simply not do the trick because science is global, knowledge is and should be, at least to my mind, a common good. And researchers and research ideas, well, they travel the globe. So more than one country, more than one institution, this is something we need to do together in order to make change, in order to uh, change come true. To ensure, to ensure that our Norwegian working group on rewards and recognition career assessment was in line with the international discussion, so to speak, we took the initiative to this uh, EUA session and series of, of uh, webinars. Originally a seminar in, uh, in Oslo though, but still I think this is, is uh, very helpful and fruitful. Um, Oslo in May would have been wonderful, but I'm sure that we will achieve what we planned also through the internet. As you all know, uh, COVID-19 forced us to alter the frame for all for, for this workshop as for many other workshops and seminars that has been planned on campuses throughout Europe. It has changed the frame from coming together at a physical spot to a virtual meeting facilitated by modern ICT technology. And in challenging like these, I am happy that um, we found a way to, to progress because we need to do that. We need to progress in these issues. After all, there is no real alternative to moving forward in a concerted, collaborative way. Already we have, from the two previous sessions, webinars on Monday and Tuesday this week, we had very fruitful discussions on where we, where we stand. What we can learn from uh, those who have tested uh, new approaches and how we can move forward. Hence, concerted action is actually needed. Only then we can make a change. The goal must be changing and broadening the uh, career assessment reward system in such a way that it is recognized among all the institutions that are present here today in universities, research institutions or funders, and of course, uh, to an even larger audience, so to speak. I'm really looking forward to this very last session in this series of, of the three uh, webinars on topics that I think will be of crucial importance to researchers in the years to come. Early careers, researchers, academics uh, in early stage of their career. Well, this will influence them to a large extent and we need to ensure to see to it that this is in a secure and uh, in the, happens in a secured way and in a concerted way for the benefit of institutions, our students, our academic staff and uh, uh, at the end of the day for our societies. Uh, so let good ideas travel and uh, looking forward to the seminar and heartily welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much um, indeed, um, Dak. Um, 
Okay, now um, it's time for us to, you know, keep uh, working and ha start the discussion with our um, speakers. Um, I will invite the, the, our speakers one by one um, to give a short presentation. And the first uh, speaker is Johannes Love Oak. Um, Johannes is the director of uh, the Department for University and University College Policy at the Research Council Norway. Um, he will tell us um, a, about a national working group on research assessment that has been uh, mentioned and um, will uh, tell us about um, the evaluation processes, so the evaluation processes of uh, proposals. Um, I think, Johannes, you're mapping uh, current practices and exploring how to improve. Can you tell us more? Yes, sure. And uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting us as a funder into this good company. And uh, as Dag Rune said, uh, May in Oslo is now at its most beautiful. And uh, I'm sitting here uh, on the outskirts, uh, outskirts of Norway, uh, of Oslo. And uh, I would really have liked to meet you all here. But, well, circumstances uh, didn't allow for that. So some other day, perhaps. I will uh, start off with um, uh, giving you a background on where the Research Council of Norway is at the moment in, in, um, uh, in these uh, uh, matters. Um, uh, we are uh, by far the uh, largest funder, uh, external funder of uh, research in, in Norway. And uh, we have worked for a long time on open access issues and have had uh, different revised versions of our policies towards uh, open access. Um, we were one of the first uh, and founding signatories of Plan S, as has been mentioned. Um, and uh, we have now uh, just recently launched a very broad uh, open science policy that uh, encompasses uh, almost every um, thing we do uh, as a research and innovation funder. Uh, and we are now uh, trying to implement uh, both Plan S principles and our uh, and work on how to implement open science practices uh, in large uh, in our activities. We are also a signatory of uh, the DORA declaration, and that's of course uh, crucial when we talk about uh, the assessments of uh, researchers and research. So our uh, principle or or overarching position is that the research assessment uh, must be aligned with with how research is developing um, and we think it's uh, becoming more and more important that we assess also a wider range of research outputs than has normally been done uh, and we need uh, assessment mechanisms and tools that promote both healthy uh, research culture and innovation research that meets our goals of uh, the investment we, we do in uh, in research and innovation. Now, there has been uh, quite a heated debate in Norway about uh, the uh, positions of the Research Council on um, especially Plan S uh, and uh, the, the actions com uh, connected with that. But we have had quite a lot of interesting debate uh, and dialogue also uh, here with uh, with research institutions and researchers um, going back to the launch of, of Plan S. And um, I think the debate and the discussions have moved quite rapidly the last year and a half uh, here in Norway uh, when it concerns these matters. We are plainly speaking on a different level now uh, discussing uh, open access. Uh, and one of the things, as has been mentioned, we we take part in in is this working group with the universities of Norway, um, and uh, we are we're happy for that initiative, and it uh, gives us an opportunity to have uh, continuous uh, relations and discussion in and have a fora for for developing uh, uh, research assessment um, together and in dialogue with the uh, research performing institutions. Um, 
So we think it's important to have uh, both some alignment and common understanding about res uh, among research institutions and research funders on these issues. Um, and, and that's why we are engaged in these activities nationally. Um, but I would say this, it's also clear that um, uh, the research funders have different needs in our assessment processes uh, and, and than uh, the research institutions have. So we are uh, 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 we are uh, assessing uh, for, uh, first and foremost uh, the uh, research applications, the ideas, the research propositions, uh, and uh, the evaluation or assessments of the uh, uh, researchers that are going to conduct uh, these projects are uh, of course important, but is not the major focus point for us. So we try to to to, to balance this. Um, um, we urge our panels uh, to uh, uh, to put weight on the not the quantity of publications when they assess uh, the uh, merits of researchers, uh, but they are, are supposed to look at a, a smaller list of the best the best articles or the best publications the, the researchers themselves think are their, their best achievements or uh, contributions. And we are very uh, uh, clear to our panels that the journal impact factor and similar uh, uh, measurements are not going to be used uh, in the assessment of, of uh, researchers. And we also uh, try now to, to develop our uh, CVs and uh, the, the templates for the CVs and the track records in order to incorporate uh, research outputs besides publications like data sets, software, uh, different activities with social impacts and so on. So we are working now uh, and trying to develop uh, on the tools here. Uh, and we hope also to have perhaps in the future to develop a more flexible uh, CV to meet the more specific needs uh, we have to uh, when evaluating uh, evaluating researchers in different contexts. Of course, we have to have uh, uh, some templates, and there has to be uh, an equal treatment. But they, then perhaps we have needs to 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 evaluate uh, some parts of uh, researchers' merits uh, more in in one context than and in another. For example, in bottom-up uh, uh, so, uh, funding schemes, them and uh, and more uh, um, uh, um, applied science uh, context. Okay. Yeah. So um, so we are ha uh, happy to to work and have a dialogue with uh, the research institutions uh, and the researchers, and uh, we would think that uh, we we need to have. Uh, alignment and concerted uh, approach to this but respecting or seeing the different needs uh, for f the funders have and the research institutions have i think i'll stop there thank you very much Johannes. um our next speaker uh i will call her right now is uh, kim open um Kim is Program Manager of Recognition and Rewards at VSNU, the Association of Universities in the Netherlands. And the reason I'm um, asking her, well, you see it already on uh, screen, is that um, there is a national concerted approach um, in the Netherlands to discuss um, recognition and rewards. And there is a position paper that was published um, in November 19, uh, Room for Everyone's Talent. And um, I'm happy now to let uh, Kim um, explain you a bit about this uh, position paper and the entire uh, approach there. Thank you so much. Um, 
Uh, thank you so much, Vincent Gaillard, for your kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much, uh, European University Association, for inviting me to this webinar series on academic career assessment and for giving me the opportunity to uh, uh, discuss with you the Dutch approach in modernizing the system of recognition and rewards in academia. Vincent already explained that we launched our position paper, Room for Everyone's Talent, last year on a conference we organized together with EUA um, in Rotterdam. And today I would like to explain what we want to change in academic career assessment in the Netherlands. I'm Kim Huypen, working from an empty office today um, of the Association of Universities in the Netherlands, and I'm a program manager uh, for a broad coalition, a broad coalition of uh, universities, university medical centers, uh, research funders, uh, research institutes, and the Royal Academy. And uh, we all work together in the Netherlands on uh, this uh, issue of recognition and rewards. And we do this because we see a mismatch uh, between what we deem important in academic work and how we reward academic staff. So careers depend heavily on research performance um, and um, academics are being measured by a limited number of criteria. And what we aim for is a healthy and inspiring environment in academia where all talents are valued, teaching, research, outreach, patient care and academic leadership. And we are really talking about a change of culture. We are aware uh, that changing procedures and forms is important, but it does not equal changing culture and assessment. Changing culture is difficult and it takes a long time. And we think that a broad dialogue um, among our uh, scholars is crucial to really change the academic culture and to give our, um, our academics influence in how they are assessed. Um, there's a broad consensus in the Netherlands that this change is needed uh, and we know we cannot do this um, in isolation. So every university and every research organization uh, has set up a high level committee and the chairs of these committees have met in online meetings and they are very motivated uh, to set up a change program per institution, even in these difficult times where all academic staff is working from home. Um, however, organizing uh, the dialogue is very difficult these days, uh, but we are really still um, moving forward and making progress. What do we want to change? We want to enable the diversification of career paths and promoting excellence in each of the key areas, education, research, impact, leadership and patient care. We want to recognize team performances. We want to emphasize quality of work over quantitative results, such as number of publication of age index, our journal impact factor. We want to encourage all aspects of open science and high quality leadership in academia. Um, there are also, we have some examples of, of what we are already doing in the Netherlands. So we, we already published a strategy evaluation protocol and with this flexible protocol, all research groups in the Netherlands uh, will be evaluated. Um, and open science and this new idea on how to, how to look at recognition and rewards of academics that's really, really crucial in this, um, in this new strategy evaluation protocol. Uh, and also the funders in the in the Netherlands are all also making really big steps uh, and perhaps I know that some of my colleagues from from NWO um, and probably also Zon and Bay are in the audience so maybe you can you can put a link in the chat on on what you are doing uh, to already make changes and and work on uh, for example a narrative CV uh, in the talent programs. But we are aware that the Netherlands is only a very small country. We cannot change academic career assessment on our own. We need to work together in Europe and beyond. And I hope you will be curious, critical, open about your concerns and become involved. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kim. Okay, so we've had a first um, presentation on um, the Norwegian uh, situation, also from the research funders uh, perspective. Here we've had a presentation on the consortium at national level, very wide with all actors, and that is in um, 
the Netherlands. Now I, and, and here she is already, that's great, thank you. I'm uh, happy to have as a next speaker, um, Pastora Martinez Samper. But um, Pastora is a member of the EUA expert group on open science. She's the vice president uh, for globalization and cooperation at the Open University of, of Catalonia. And um, here, the interest uh, from our side was to have the institutional level. So you're working in a university that is very much engaged in this um, discussion and this dialogue. Uh, but the national and uh, regional context um, is not to um, a well, in a concerted uh, approach, as you can see in the Netherlands for now. Um, the question here is um, if that has any impact on what you can do um, at the institutional level, and maybe you would have any requests or needs um, from the higher level for uh, for you to be able to step up. So we are very happy to hear you, uh, Bastoa. Merci, Vincian, and thank you very much for the opportunity to give an example of this European diversity, because there's no single formula in order to address this cultural change the open science is really about, and it is important to also stress it here. So let me... Uh, yeah, let me show you very briefly how the academic career process is in Spain. So basically in Spain, we use a combination of qualitative peer review and quantitative metrics. Um, the other point that is important to stress is all those Spanish universities have the autonomy to organize their own internal procedures for hiring and promoting academics. In practice, an important part of these processes is delegated to evaluation agencies that certify the quality of the degrees, but also take part in the academic career assessment. And in fact, candidates to lecturer or professor open positions at the Spanish public universities must first obtain a specific accreditation from these evaluation agencies. And this is a lot of paperwork indeed. Um, and the third point is for now, the research publications and research projects are the academic activities more most valued when assessing academics. And when it comes to publication metrics, there is a widespread use of the impact factor as also shown at the UA survey presented um, on Monday. But here in Spain, uh, it's even much, even higher with the 90% of this uh, metric, uh, specifically uh, versus a 75% on the survey. So basically, currently, uh, research assessment practices in Spain do not incentivize researchers for embracing the open science principle. But the good, good thing here is that there's a lot of room for improvement. And in that sense, um, uh, there have been some movements in the last years, and I want to stress these three ones. So in February last year, the Spanish Vectors Conference published a statement entitled University Commitment to Open Science with 10 commitments. And number six is, and I quote, implementing, the uh, implementing systems of incentives and recognition within universities that are in line with the aims of open science that entail the modification of the current criteria used in the evaluation of researchers, units, and projects. Also, things are starting to move uh, from the agencies. Uh, so here, the Catalan Evaluation Agency, Diacu, signed Dora last month, and we are eager to discover how it will affect to the evaluation assessments here in Catalonia. And last week, uh, the Spanish Ministry of Science created the Spanish Committee for Open Science with the mission to elaborate uh, Spanish policy for open science by 2020. So um, the movement is here and it's also coming from the, from the university. Um, some universities have started to move and here let me share you uh, the example of mine that you will see. So at the Open University of Catalonia, we are convinced that knowledge is essential for addressing the global challenges we are facing and also that the main obstacles that prevent academia from sharing or and expanding our knowledge efficiently and effectively are addressed by open science 
So to overcome these obstacles at the UOC, we launched two years ago our Open Knowledge Action Plan, a plan that identifies the six main areas you can see here and three other more transversal and in the main areas, uh, research evaluation models is here as well. Um, and what have we done so far regarding research assessment? So two years ago, we created an interdisciplinary working group, an internal one, and after a reflective process, and when uh, we were pretty sure that we could do something related to DORA at the UOC, we signed it. Uh, so at the time we were the first Spanish universities to do so. So last year we started changing our internal goals, focusing in quality and not in quantity. And basically what we did is no impact factor could be used for peer review. And also we include a narrative. And we know this is a very small change, but this small change has enabled us to open a more general debate concerning how we are assessing careers at the UOC. And also this intense debate has made us realize the long way we still have ahead and how difficult it is to convert theory into practice. And that brings me to my last uh, slide. And I wanted to finish with these reflections uh, why it is so difficult to change research assessment. So I'm gonna give here are three main reasons and a final dilemma. So for me, the three main reasons are, first of all, the context. So the research assessment uh, landscape, as already mentioned, is composed by a huge number of institutions in different type, with different types and missions. And in fact, the EUA survey on research assessment already point out that the main barriers for the institutions to reform its research assessment procedures were the complexity of research assessment reform and the lack of institutional capacity. So the lack of change is not because of a lack of institutional autonomy, but it is probably much more related with the lack of a broad consensus on the needed cultural change. As the second reason, change resistance within the university community. So not everybody or the, or the academic community, not everybody is for a change. And here raising awareness is key in order to generate this movement. And the third point, but it is a very important point, is actually we don't know how to do it. There's no magical recipe and we must explore and try till we find the best solution for each assessment, for each institution. Um, yeah. And finally, the dilemma already mentioned by Bernard Rontier yesterday. So how implement these changes without damaging individual careers or the careers of the ones starting now, I mean, the PhD students. So in conclusion, uh, just to stress it, that revisiting research assessment procedures is a shared responsibility and requires a concerted approach uniting the main actors. And with this, I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Okay, so that was an institutional um, perspective in a wider context. Now we will go back to a, a national um, perspective, and we go back to the up to the north. So I will um, invite Enrica Mustayoki to join me. Um, Enrica is the national head of open science development at the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. And um, here, Enrica will um, present uh, something in her capacity as a chair of a national working group um, that uh, worked on responsible um, evaluation of uh, researchers in uh, Finland. Um, very interesting. Um, there, there are some recommendations. I think that you will tell us uh, a bit more about those recommendations, Enrica, and maybe um, also about the, the process that uh, led to uh, this position or policy uh, paper with the recommendation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for organizing um, the Oslo event. I'd rather be there, but this is a wonderful opportunity for us to get together and share our views and experiences on 
career um, rewards and incentives in Europe around research. Um, in Finland, we started with the, uh, the same thoughts and it's quite reassuring to be speaking after the previous speakers to realize that the path has been very similar to most of us. So we started with the thought that there was a great disparity in what we said we valued in research and what we evaluated when we were evaluating researchers and research. And we felt that the disparity was damaging um, to our researchers' careers, adding stress, and specifically not creating the research culture that we said we would want to create. So in 2018, the Finnish research community got together, the research funders, the research reforming organisations, um, and, and, and even the, um, the unions for the academics. And we sat together and thought, what would, could we do? We talked about leadership, we talked about principles, and in the end, we um, produced a paper, and I, I'm going to share with you the link if you want to have a closer look at it, um, on, on a good practices for researcher evaluation. It was published in March this year, and it's available on our website in Swedish and English and Finnish. So what we thought was that we needed some principles that would be the same for everyone, regardless on the position that they were looking at researchers um, careers and assessing and evaluating them, whether you're a funder or it's about career progression or whichever um, position you might be in. We came up with five key principles, transparency, in integrity, fairness, competence and diversity. And from those principles, we came up with a set of good practices that we thought in every evaluation scenario, the evaluation should consider. We did not want to share specifically how these should be interpreted, but more as a, as a, a conversation starter um, on saying, you need to have thought about these for your evaluation to be responsible. And one of the key elements was constantly about more open research community and more open science. So we came up, there were four different elements. First one was about building the evaluation process. We felt very strongly in our working group that the, the design of the evaluation is the key. So we needed objectives and criteria to be relevant and available to everyone, that the evidence is comprehensive and fair, that the evaluators and evaluation guidelines support a balanced evaluation process. And we had a, a lot of emphasis on equality. We needed a system that protects against discrimination. Um, and then probably from the urban science perspective, the most important element in our recommendations, talk about the evaluation of research. Um, there was question about metrics, and we all know the, the issues around metrics. And we did not want to state that metrics could not be used. The emphasis would be about using relevant metrics, and the onus of proof would have to be with the people who choose the metrics, and which metrics they're going to use, and how they're going to use them. We wanted to emphasize that open access to research, both publications, data, our algorithms is important part of researchers' work, and we wanted to focus on research ethics as well. Um, the second one talks about the diversity, and here I saw a very clear link with the Dutch recommendations. We wanted um, evaluation to always consider teaching, the social impact, um, activity in the research communities, and and make this all relevant to a particular research field. And lastly, um, we felt it was really important that the researcher's role in the evaluation process is considered. Um, so we encourage uh, self-evaluation, the holistic evaluation, a narrative type evaluation, and we wanted all evaluation to include elements that would support the career development. At the moment, um, we're looking into creating a maturity review of the evaluation processes in the Finnish research community. We are very aware that international collaboration is crucial for us to change 
the community. And um, we're also looking into creating a national portfolio system. So I hope this um, series of webinars is a great way for us to find more international co collaboration so that our evaluation systems can be vehicles to change the research culture. So thank you very much for this opportunity to share a little bit of our Finnish scenario. Thank you very much, uh, Enrique. Very nice. Um, thank you slide. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've had a sample of different um, uh, initiatives at uh, national level, also um, institutional level, and now it's time for us to uh, have a broader um, pan-European, let's say, um, uh, perspective. And the best person to address this is Cecilia Cabello Valdez. She's already there. Thank you. Um, because uh, Cecilia is the chair of the ERAC Standing Committee, um, Standing Working Group on Human Resources and Mobility. ERAC stands for European Research Area and Innovation Committee. So within ERAC, um, She's leading the working group on uh, human resources and mobility. Um, Cecilia is also the director of RNI policies and internationalization at the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. And so, Cecilia, um, we know um, there is a a new uh, communication from the European Commission coming in on the ERA. Um, we know that within um, ERA and the new um, policy objectives and priorities, we know that academic career assessment, that uh, recognition, rewards and um, recognitions um, incentives are very high on the agenda. So could you please tell us how this, uh, those um, policy developments at um, uh, European level, how can they um, impact or are they articulated with uh, national initiatives to revisit um, career uh, assessment and evaluation practices? Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon to everybody and thanks for the EUA for the invitation to participate. It's a great pleasure for me to be here to congratulate you for, the, for this webinar for the three days. I've assisted the two other days and it's been very interesting. Like you said, we've heard from the previous speakers on the national experience and the perspectives, which I think has been very interesting to listen to and, and there's a lot that we can, we can learn from them. Um, I would like to talk about the, the Standing Working Group for Human Resources resources and mobility for, of ERAC, like you mentioned, and um, introduce a little bit what it is, uh, what, what do we do? Um, the group, it's, it's, it's a structure to support the implementation and monitoring of the progress of the European Research Area and Innovation for Priority 3, specifically, which many of you know, is the open labor market for researchers, um, which really what, what it wants to address is um, the attractiveness of research careers, everything that involves that, and also more specifically, the removal of barriers to research mobility and, and issues that you're doing with training. So the standing working group it has representatives which gather together. They provide and share information on the overall plans and strategies that are um, devised and they're drawn up at national level and see how these can feed into the ETA framework, which is the European uh, framework. And uh, they see exactly specifically how the different type of initiatives at the, in the national context can um, be a basis for the, the European, European level policy. So the delegates from the member states and associated countries that are uh, represented in the standing working group are not individual experts. They're basically, um, they ensure their, their country represent, representation. They, they represent their countries and they uh, liaison with the other uh, uh, ETA related groups also. So the secretariat of the standard working group is the European Council. Um, and as you said, uh, we are under the remit of ERAC. Why do I mention this? Because we are not, uh, we do not depend on the European Commission. The European Commission is a part of the group. It's a member of the group. So what we do is we provide counsel and advice to the European ERAC or to the European Council. So we're a member state group. So we, um, 
we we want to feed into what the the European Commission is developing with it within with uh, the new communication, but we're not directly involved in in what is what is developing. So, like I said before, we we are talking about the implementation of monitoring and the implementation of the uh, uh, priority three, the open labor market for researcher, the specifically the national action plans. What are these national action plans? These national action plans, each member state have developed a roadmap of how they, um, the different measures and initiatives will achieve ERA. And so the group puts puts these uh, these programs and these measures together and analyze exactly what it is that feeds in, can feed into it at a European dimension. So it's it's a it's a process of where we uh, feed into each other and we learn from each other and we share experiences to be able to feed into the into the European policy. And before, when we were a standing working group for, uh, or a standing group for the European Commission, um, which is different because a lot of the policy results came out directly and have turned into things that you, I think, are very familiar with, like the European Charter and Code for researchers, the framework for researchers, the innovative doctoral training program, the open transparent merit-based recruitment uh, guidelines, um, the, the report on providing researchers with education and skills and open science. And, and obviously the, the most uh, related to this webinar was the report that this group did uh, called Evaluation of Research Careers, Fully Acknowledging Open Science Practices, Rewards and Incentives for Researchers. So this group, uh, when it was under the European Commission, developed this report. And obviously the Bernard and others that are attending the, the seminar are authors of this report, which I think is really important because this was done in 2017, which I think triggered a lot of the national uh, context and the national incentives. And that's kind of what we want to do. Our group um, analyzes and puts these things on the table so that the, the, the national context can, can react and work and see what it best fits in, in their circumstances. So like was said in the, in the first day, um, this is all about uh, shared responsibility. It's about shared responsibility to be able to get a European perspective. Um, some of the recent work that we've been doing in our group has to do with linking what has to do with the European research area and the European higher education area. For the first time, um, which may be surprising, the director generals of research met together with the director generals of higher education under the Finnish presidency, presidency in October, 2019. So the group, what they did is provided a discussion and a working document so that the discussions would be more fluid. And, and basically we, we know that researchers and the researchers career was the tie between both of these um, uh, policy initiatives. Right now, the most recent work that I'd like to mention is the fact that we have a joint task force that we're, we're developing with the Open Science and Innovation Group and the Gender Research and Innovation Group. And the joint task force wants to work on two goals. Recommend, recommendations on training incentives and evaluation for researchers with open science and gender perspective, which I think will obviously feed on many of the things that we've heard in these past three days, and the revision of the charter and code also with open science and gender pris, uh, prisms. So this is the, the recent task force that we're gonna be working on in 2020, which I think um, from what we've heard in these past three days will be very useful to bring into the European dimension. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. I will invite you now to turn your video off, but to remain on audio, I will uh, invite um, all the speakers to join uh, with their audio so that they can rapidly come to uh, questions. So we, I see that um, we have many questions uh, coming from the audience. A first um, question for Johannes. Um, it's a question about, okay, uh, saying that everyone knows what a uh, journal impact factor is. Uh, we can like it or not, but we all know what it is. Uh, when we turn to other approaches, other ways, then um, there is a risk um, that um, it would be um, very vague when we have to assess quality and impact. Do you, can you comment on this? Yes. Um, um, 
Well, um, we, we try to, uh, I mean, the, the reason why we are, uh, have signed DORA and the reason why we are not using journal impact factor in our assessment is that uh, we don't believe in them as um, good indicators of quality. Um, they are surrogate uh, uh, indicators and, and uh, they are not uh, really uh, giving us um, or that we cannot rely on them to 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 display uh, or to to assess uh, the quality of the research done. So that's that's easy. So uh, uh, so it's it's of course uh, it's easy to 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 to, to have a, a certain seemingly objective uh, uh, measurements as an impact factor, but it's really not useful and it's not promoting a healthy research culture. Um, but we we are, uh, I, I will have to admit that we are looking for ways of how to assess the qualities of research output in other ways. And, and uh, of course, our panels are, will not be able to, uh, or panel members, experts will not be able to read uh, a large amount of publications from the applicants. Uh, Monday, we will receive perhaps two and a half thousand uh, applications for research projects with a, a, quite a number of researchers uh, connected to them. So, so uh, this has to be to be worked on, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but really, uh, journal impact factor is not a good measurement. That's the bottom line. As okay. <laughs> Very clear message. Thank you. Uh, now I turn to Enrica. Um, um, there was a comment as to um, something very good. Would you consider that evaluation is then a supportive mechanism? And then how would you um, organize this? Um, absolutely. I, I think um, evaluation is probably our best vehicle for any change because um, our research community is very astute to deliver what we ask of them to deliver. So when we design evaluation, we're telling them what's valuable um, and, and changing something that's been probably quite narrow from an open science perspective um, will require, I was kind of keeping an eye on the chat, it will require um, leadership, it will require courage, and it will require a lot of collaboration of, of different members in the research community. But more than anything, I believe it will require a will to change the way we're doing things at the moment. It, it will require us to agree on the values that, um, that we have kept important and in the front line now and say we actually genuinely want to make a world that corresponds with those values. And I think that the time is now. Um, mm. I think the conversations around changing evaluation and, and creating genuine change in a research community are now popping up in every possible event. So now is our crucial time to create that change. You've had an enormous attendance in these webinars, which is a sign that we are ready for some change. Well, this is a very powerful and optimistic, uh, very, very uh, message. Um, I like it very much, and I agree. Um, time is now, and and we have to to move together. Um, now that we are talking about moving and implementing um, the changes, uh, here's a question for Kim about this um, cultural change. Um, how do you see uh, a potential role of uh, uh, for role models? So at the level of um, institutions, but also like within institutions, could be mentors, um, leaders? Yeah, I think um, um, what Hen Henrika just said um, and what um, Mark Shields uh, um, suggested on Monday, I think that's that's really crucial um, uh, right at this at this moment. I hope indeed that we are at a transformative 
moment, like Mars Shield suggested. So never before science was so open, never before there was so much cooperation in science. And I would like to add, uh, for the last decades, it was never so clear that um, that the hearts and minds of our scholars are with their students. Uh, so in the Netherlands, uh, and I hope everywhere in Europe, our academics uh, have made such a flexible and dedicated effort to get uh, our education online. Um, and I think it's incredible at what pace that happened. Uh, so I think uh, now is the time to give our academics the recognition they deserve for their public outreach activities around COVID-19, uh, for example, for opening up science and for uh, developing online education. Uh, and I think this uh, could really help in, uh, in our movement. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question for um, Pastora also. So uh, indeed the, the, the context is different um, in Spain. Um, how do you see um, a possible, let's say, transposition or um, yeah, sort of replication of the national, the, the other national initiatives? Um, is this something you, you see that is possible? We've seen that there has been uh, recent changes and developments in Spain. How do you see this? How, how would you approach that? I think we are all learning from each other. So uh, any movement, any best practice uh, we have is very important to be shared. And uh, the European umbrella, what can give us is basically this no? sharing also perspectives from the uh, from the 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 governance side the institutional side but I think it is also very very important to raise uh, awareness also among researchers because here there's a huge community now discussing on open science but um, I'm also convinced that there are many many people uh, that don't know what this is about so I think we should have pushed for the top down and the bottom up approaches, uh, but for sure, any best practice, any other learned lessons uh, will help the other countries, institutions and, and regions to, to go for the open science. And um, may I add something with the Corona crisis, because we were just pointing this out and, and I think it's for sure this Corona crisis also uh, um, is pointing out and stresses how the communication uh, uh, of science or of research uh, results is important uh, to be changed. But here, just to stress and point out uh, some of the difficulties right now, um, and for instance, concerning gender issues, and we've seen the last uh, days uh, how the number of uh, papers uh, submitted by women has been uh, has dropped down, uh, and not for the ones uh, sent by males. And this could happen also with the different generations, also different disciplines. So um, now it's time for change and for change in order to this transition to open science for more uh, fair and open uh, system. Thank you, Basora. Um, Cecilia, do you want to add something here um, shortly? Because I think that is very I'm good dying. for you to come in. <laughs> No, I, I just think, to, uh, can you hear me? I think you can't we, see I, me. Yes, we can hear you perfectly well. Uh, okay, um, for some reasons I can't, my mouse is not working to get my video back on. I was gonna add the idea about, uh, to continue a little bit what Pastora said about the COVID crisis. I think the whole idea that this has transformed a little bit the whole uh, researchers' careers and the research profession. And I think this is important. The, the valuation and assessment of research career has to, has to also include the different dimensions that the researchers are taking on. And I think the fact that they're providing advice to inform governments, they're providing evidence for the decision making, they're doing outreach and dissemination activities for the general public to understand what's going on with the COVID crisis, and they're attending media and the press also to to also uh, help other understand science. So I think the research profession is, is it's, it's definitely, there's a need for more recognition and, and this, these type of things also should be included in the assessment process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much all. Um, it's the end already of this very vibrant uh, discussion. We would have, 
had um, two more hours, we would have still be uh, busy uh, talking about all this. Um, I wanted here to thank all the speakers, the speakers of the three webinars, the audience of the three webinars. Um, very interesting presentations, super lively uh, chat and engagement. We are very happy with this. Um, I would like, of course, to thank um, um, uh, also the members of the EUA expert group on open science and the subgroup on research assessment and certainly uh, their chairs, um, Jean-Pierre Finance and Bernard Rantier. I would like to thank the members of the program committee of this event, this series of uh, virtual events. And definitely, and last but not least, I don't want to um, miss out the opportunity to thank the colleagues from EUA who did an incredible job behind the scene to transforming um, this physical event workshop to a series of webinar. Um, it's Aurélie Clenet, Ines Mezer, Lenka Kuzelova and of course uh, Brecht Sanen. Um, thank you very much, all of you. Now um, to uh, just remind you that these webinars have been recorded, the presentation material and the recordings will be made available. You will have the possibility to download a certificate of attendance. Um, it will be you, you can click on a thank you email you will receive. And just before I uh, end, uh, I would like to um, highlight some uh, coming webinars for EUA. You see them on screen next week on uh, the effective curricular design. And after that, a webinar for EUA members um, on the European Union's response to the coronavirus virus crisis and what is important there for universities. Universities. You have many more in the weeks coming, the coming weeks, so please just uh, stay tuned, EUA website, and you will find all the information. And with this, I close and I wish you a very pleasant afternoon. <laughs>